Lessons thirteen and fourteen of the History of London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. The History of London by Walter Besant. Lesson thirteen. Fitzstephen's Account of the City. Part one. The White Tower is the only building in modern London which belongs to Norman London. Portions remain, fragments, a part of the Church of St. Bartholomew the Great, a part of the Church of St. Ethelburga, the crypt of Bow Church, very little else. All the rest has been destroyed by time, by improvements, or by fire, the greatest enemy to cities in every country and every age. Thus three great fires in the tenth and eleventh century swept London from end to end. No need to ask if anything remains of the Roman or the Saxon city, not a vestige is left, except the little fragment known as the London Stone, now lying behind iron bars in the wall of St. Swithin's Church. Churches, palaces, monasteries, castles, all perished in those three fires. The city, no doubt, speedily sprang again from its ashes, but of its rebuilding on each occasion we have no details at all. Most fortunately, there exists a document priceless and unique, short as it is, and meagre in many of its details, which describes London as it was in the reign of Henry the Second. It is written by one Fitz Stephen, chaplain to Thomas Becket. He was present at the murder of the archbishop, and wrote his life, to which this account is an introduction. He says, first of all, that the city contained thirteen larger conventual churches and a hundred and twenty-six parish churches. He writes only fifty years after the great fire, so that it is not likely that new parishes had been erected. All the churches which had been destroyed were rebuilt. Most of them were very small parishes, with, doubtless, very small churches. We shall return presently to the question of the churches. On the east was the White Tower, which he calls the Palatine Castle. On the west there were two towers. There was the tower called Montfichet, where is now Blackfriars Station, and Baynard's Castle close beside it. The walls of the city had seven double gates. The river wall had by this time been taken down. Two miles from the city, on the west, was the Royal Palace, Westminster, fortified with ramparts, and connected with the city by a populous suburb. Already, therefore, the Strand and Charing Cross were settled. The gates were Aldgate, Bishopsgate, Cripplegate, Aldersgate, Newgate, Ludgate, and the Bridge. Fitzstephen says that the citizens were so powerful that they could furnish the king with twenty thousand horsemen and sixty thousand foot. This is clearly gross exaggeration. If we allow five hundred for each parish, we get a population of only sixty-three thousand in all, and in the enumeration later on, for the poll tax by Richard the Second, there were no more than forty-eight thousand. This, however, was shortly after a great plague had ravaged the city. But the writer tells us that the citizens excelled those of any other city in the world in, quote, handsomeness of manners and of dress, at table, and in way of speaking, end quote. There were three principal schools, the scholars of which rivalled each other and engaged in public contests of rhetoric and grammar. Those who worked at trades and sold wares of any kind were assigned their proper place whither they repaired every morning. It is easy to make out from the surviving names where the trades were placed. The names of Bread Street, Fish Street, Milk Street, Honey Lane, Wood Street, Soapers Lane, The Poultry, for instance, indicate what trades were carried on there. Friday Street shows that the food proper for fast days was sold there, namely dried fish. Cheapside preserves the name of the Cheap, the most important of all the old streets. 
Here, every day, all the year round, was a market held, at which everything conceivable was sold, not in shops, but in selds, that is, covered wooden sheds, which could be taken down on occasion. Do not think that Cheap was a narrow street, it was a great open space lying between St. Paul's and what is now the Royal Exchange, with streets north and south formed by rows of these selds or sheds. Presently the sheds became houses with shops in front and gardens behind. The roadway on the south side of this open space was called the Side of Cheap. There was another open space for salesmen called East Cheap, another at Billingsgate called Room Lane, another at Dowgate, both for purposes of exposing for sale imports landed on the quays and the ports of Queenhithe and Billingsgate. Those who have seen a market-place in a French town will understand what these places were like. A large, irregular area. On every side, sheds with wares for sale. At first, all seems confusion and noise. Presently, one makes out that there are streets in orderly array, in which those who know can find what they want. Here are mercers, here goldsmiths, here armourers, here glovers here pepperers or grocers, and so forth. Westcheap is the place of shops where they sell the things made in the city, and all things wanted for the daily life. On the other side of the Walbrook, across which there is a bridge where is now the poultry, is Eastcheap, whither they bring all kinds of imported goods and sell them to the retailers. And by the riverside, the merchants assemble in the open places beside Queenhithe and Billingsgate to receive or to buy the cargoes sent over from France, Spain and the Low Countries. One more open space there was, that round St. Paul's, the place where the people held their folk moats. But London was not, as yet, by any means built over. Its northern parts were covered with gardens. It was here as we shall see, that the great monasteries were shortly to be built. End of Lesson 13 Lesson 14 Fitz Stephen's Account of the City, Part 2 Outside the walls, he says, there were many places of pleasant resort, streams and springs among them. He means the Fleet River winding at the bottom of its broad valley, farther west Tyburn and Westbourne, on the south, the Wandle, the Ephra, the Ravensbourne. There was a well at Holywell in the Strand, it lies under the site of the present Opera Comique Theatre, and at Clerkenwell. These wells had medicinal or miraculous properties, and there were, no doubt, taverns and places of amusement about there. At Smithfield, or Smoothfield, just outside the city walls, there was held, once a week, on Friday, a horse-fair. Business over, horse-racing followed. Then the river was full of fish. Some went fishing for their livelihood, some for amusement. Salmon were plentiful, and great fish such as porpoises sometimes found their way above bridge. Then there were the sports of the young men and the boys. They played at ball, when have not young men played at ball? The young Londoners practised some form of hockey, out of which have grown the two noble games of cricket and golf. They wrestled and leapt. Nothing is said about boxing and quarter-staff, but perhaps these belonged to the practice of arms and archery, which were never neglected, because at any moment the London craftsman might have to become a soldier. They had cock-fighting, a sport to which the Londoner was always greatly addicted. And they loved dancing with the girls to the music of pipe and tabor. In the winter, when the broad fens north of the walls were frozen, they skated, and they hunted with hawk and hound in the forest of Middlesex, which belonged to the city. The city, he tells us, is governed by the same laws as those of Rome. Like Rome, London is divided into wards, like Rome the city has annually elected magistrates, 
who are called sheriffs instead of consuls. Like Rome, it has senatorial and inferior magistrates. Like Rome, it has separate courts and proper places for lawsuits. And like Rome, the city holds assemblies on ordered days. The writer is carried away by his enthusiasm for Rome. As we have seen, the government, laws, and customs of London owed nothing at all in any single respect to Rome. Everything grew out of the Anglo-Saxon laws and customs. By his loud praise of the great plenty of food of every kind which could be found in London, Fitzstephen reminds us that he has lived in other towns, and especially in Canterbury, when he was in the service of the Archbishop. We see though he does not mention it, the comparison in his mind between the plentiful market of London and the meagre market of Canterbury. Everything, he says, was on sale. All the roasted meats and boiled that one can ask for, all the fish, poultry and game in season, could every day be bought in London. There were cook-shops where dinners and suppers could be had by paying for them. He dwells at length upon this abundance. Now in the country towns and the villages the supplies were a matter of uncertainty and anxiety. A housewife had to keep her pantry and her larder well victualled in advance. Salt meat and salt fish were the staple of food. Beef and mutton were scarce. Game there was in plenty if it could be taken, but game laws were strict very little venison would find its way into Canterbury market. To this cleric, who knew the country markets, the profusion of everything in London was amazing. Another thing he notices, quote, Nearly all the bishops, abbots, and magnates of England are, as it were, citizens and freemen of London, having their own splendid houses to which they resort, where they spend largely when summoned to great councils by the king, or by their metropolitan, or drawn thither by their own private affairs. End quote. In another century or two, London will become, as you shall see, a city of palaces. Observe that the palaces are already beginning. Observe also that London is already being enriched by the visits and residence of great lords who, with their retinues, spend, quote, largely, unquote. Down to the present day the same thing has always gone on. The wealthy people who have their town-houses in the west end of London, and the thousands of country people and foreigners who now flock to the London hotels, are the successors of the great men and their following who came up to London in the twelfth century and spent largely. I do not think, says Fitzstephen, that there is any city with more commendable customs of church attendance, honour to God's ordinances, keeping sacred festivals, almsgiving, hospitality, confirming, betrothals, contracting marriages, celebration of nuptials, preparing feasts, cheering the guests, and also in care for funerals and the interment of the dead. The only pests of London are the immoderate drinking of fools and the frequency of fires. End of lesson fourteen. Recording by Ruth Golding.